Welcome back to Yes, We're Here. It is Jimmy Spinarkle Day here on Yes, Jimmy. Always amazing to see you. We are going back to 1979, 80, a rookie year in the NBA. What do you remember most about adjusting to the showtime? Well, it's good to see you too, Nancy. And uh, what I remember about that rookie year was, uh, first of all, I think it was a long time ago. So my you know, I have, to, I have to think hard about how long ago it was, but it was a great experience in a couple of ways. You know, I finished uh, Duke in 79 and 79, 80 year, got drafted by the 76ers. And that team had some decent names on it at that particular point. You know, they had a guy named Julius Irving. They had Daryl Dawkins. They had Bobby Jones. Doug Collins was on the team. Mo Cheeks, uh, Lionel Holland. So, uh, you know, Steve Witten, Steve Mix, and also Caldwell Jones. So I think it was about eight out of the 11 guys on that team at one point or another. We're all all stars in the NBA, so I kind of got to the, the the rookie camp and like was like looking for autographs almost because I had watched them play and it was kind of like a little bit overwhelming in terms of the first experience in the NBA, but uh, an interesting first year for sure. So, what was that adjustment like playing amongst these guys and with them? Well, I think there are a couple of adjustments um, that any college kid goes through when, he, when they sign with an NBA team. You know, number one is, generally speaking, and in my case, I was starting with, the, with Duke. I was playing at just about as, you know, 80, 90 percent of the minutes that I had played in my uh, four-year career. And then all of a sudden, I get shifted to 76ers, did not play really well my rookie year, and uh, ended up sitting the bench a lot. So that was an adjustment for sure. Um, you know, the speed of the game, I think, was probably the first thing when you think about it on the court itself. Uh, the game was so much faster. In college, we were able to play zones, and we did do that at Duke where we played kind of a matchup zone. And then going into the NBA, you recognize that, hey, I can't bury myself in a zone anymore. I got to play man to man. And I realized just how fast a lot of the guards were trying to defend them as they went by. And I was just like calling for help all the time really head spinning the big names you had to play with. Did you find any commonality between these guys? What made them great? Yeah, I, I just think um, overall, I think, and I think that the real good players in the NBA or any sport have really short memories, especially when things are going badly. You know, guys don't dwell on the negative. They don't dwell on missed shots. Um, you know, if, if Dr. J was 0 for 5 to begin a game, which it probably really didn't happen that often. He didn't sit around and say, oh, what if I go 0 for 7? What if I go 0 for 10? His next thought was, I'm going to be 1 for 1, and you know, I'll be 1 for 6, but I'm going to make my next shot. So I think it's a little bit of that, that the guys have so much confidence. Sometimes guys have just so much confidence, you like shaking your head at it, but that's how you survive, and the really good ones survive that way with a short memory and, and the real strong confidence in what they can do as a player with their talents. So what was the self-talk like for you during that first season? Uh, self-talk was kind of, what, what did I get myself into here, you know? The opportunities, trying to, trying to get some playing time. And, then, and what happens when you're not playing a whole lot, and I think most, you know, most people would say this at any level of any sport, if you're not really playing a whole lot, it's hard to build up consistency of play. Um, and I understood it my rookie year because we had, a, you know, an all-star team that I was trying to get up and play, and I wasn't playing really well with the lack of confidence to some degree. But what happens is that if you get into a game, there's a tendency to try to do too much because you want to impress, you know, the coaching staff, the organization, and you get an opportunity to play. And generally speaking, that will backfire more times than not because in my case, I was only going in for maybe three to five minutes. And you know, there's just not a, you know, if you gave Dr. J three to five minutes a night in a game, he's not going to score 25 points a game because it's limited time. But the pressure was on, I think, a lot of role players, the guys getting chances, second chances off the bench. I think a lot of times you'll see players press a little bit more than they probably should. And I think it's natural and understandable at the same time. As that season played on and played out, did you know you were part of a team that was going to make a real run? Yeah, well, clearly, clearly with the talent on that team, you knew that there was, uh, you know, obviously playoffs and a good run uh, getting to the NBA Finals that year. But, you know, with, with the team that we had and, and, the, and the, the abilities, and it was really, you know, like we had a, Mo Cheeks was a great point guard. You had Dr. J, who was one of the best, obviously, forwards in the league. Daryl Dawkins and Caldwell Jones as, as the centers. 
So clearly you knew there was going to be battles with uh, the top ranking teams, you know, whether it be the Knicks at that point, but really the Celtics in the East. And then we made it all the way to the finals. And uh, it's a memorable final going back when, um, you know, we lost in the sixth game in the spectrum down in Philadelphia to the Lakers. And that was the game, the sixth game that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar did not play. And everybody thought, okay, Lakers and the uh, Sixers in the sixth game, they were leading by one game. We'll, we'll win this home game without Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was actually back in L.A. And that's when Magic Johnson started at the center position and scored 42 points. So um, Magic stepped up and we didn't step up. And the rest is history, they would say. But prior to that, there were some sensational moments, like the Eastern Conference Championship. You defeated the Celtics, and they were no slouch either. The Larry Bird was on that team. Yeah, no, they were, they were great battles, and it was great to, you know, to be part of them, um, even from a limited perspective that I had. But watching those battles, you know, with the Celtics being as great as they were, and then you had a classic matchup with Larry Bird and Dr. J. I mean, you know, I, I didn't have to pay for my seat on the bench, but I probably would have paid for a seat on the bench every night just to watch those teams go at it. It was, it was a lot of fun and a great experience. What was that celebration like? Um, you know, it wasn't that big a celebration, if I recall, because we knew what was ahead. You know, everybody realized, okay, this is just one last step before the finals. So the celebration was, it was great. Everybody knew we were moving on, but really it was more of a, okay, let's get this over with. Let's celebrate a little bit. Let's get the preparation going for the, uh, the next round in the finals. What were your takeaways of Larry Bird and Pete Maravich? Um, my takeaways with Bird was um, as much as we know what a great player Bird was over the period of time that he played, I think one of the things that I take away from him after, after all those simple things, right, the, the way he played, the talent, the passing, the shooting, I always thought of Bird as a great big game rebounder. And if you go back to games that were very important to the Celtics, Bird generally came up with like 15 or 17 rebounds. So that was the number one thing that, you know, it, it's down on the list in terms of his talents. He's not really thought of as a great rebounder or remembered, I should say, as a great rebounder, even though he was. Most people would think of him as a scorer. Most people would think of him as a great passer. But I thought he was a terrific big game rebounder. Is he on the NBA's Mount Rushmore for you? Yeah, yeah, you have to put him up there. He's um, – I, I just like the way he um, did the things that I just mentioned, but also he made players um, much, much better on the floor. And I, I think an example of that might be Robert Parrish. Parrish was not a great player when he was out in, uh, with the Warriors. Um, he was very, very good. But then when he steps on the court with Larry Bird, I think Larry Bird would take a guy who's on a one to 10 scale. If you're a seven, Larry Bird's going to get you to the eight, eight and a half. Uh, level of, of rating just because of who Larry Bird is and the way he would play the game. And I just want to get a final word from you on that Lakers series. And really, that was the birth of the Showtime Lakers, right? And your first impressions of Magic. Yeah, you know, Ma Magic, I had a chance to see from my five years in the NBA and watched him prior to that in college and um, tried to guard him a few times. Um, although I did have 28 points against the Lakers one night. Uh, Nancy, so I, I, I remember that night. Um, nice. But, but, guard, but guarding Magic was, was really interesting from the perspective of, um, you know, everybody knows he was 6'8 to 6'9, probably 6'9, that people probably didn't realize earlier in his career, wasn't, you know, wasn't a great shooter, developed that over a period of time, but he was so long and strong, and so, and he could look over people, and he was quick with his hands, so you didn't know where the ball was, you know, when he was handling it. Obviously, the name Magic was pretty well dubbed with him because it wasn't so much always his sleight of hand, which was very good, and the trick passes, but just his fundamentals were so good because of his size, his strength, his hand size, and his ability to control the ball. He could make every single pass that you could imagine. So, I mean, it was just a treat watching him and, and, and Bird and some of the players, you know, for the Lakers, you know, like, uh, like Kareem, for example. Wow, special times. Yep. So good to see you, Jimmy. And before we let you go, kudos to your wife and your daughter. They did a nice job with the shears and the haircut. Yeah, thank you. They actually, uh, it was a triple team. My wife, Janet, and daughter, Stephanie, <laughs> and, and Bridget took the shears to me. I still, I think I was still bleeding a little bit in the back because they were digging in with the shears. But uh, 
overall, I, uh, we came out of it and uh, I didn't really have to tip them all that much either, Nancy, so that wasn't bad. <laughs> Well, I guess they were sending a little subliminal message. Next time, though, I want video, okay? I'll get you the video, and I'll, get the, I'll let the mullet grow out again. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you, Jimmy. All the best to the family. Stay safe. Good to see you. Thanks, Nancy. Same to you. Stay healthy and well.